we've got a really full and interesting evening coming up. So I'm Penny Fletcher, Executive Director of the Branch, and I just want to say welcome. And uh, in case you notice, you parked in the parking lot and notice something happening, I just want to say next time you'll be able to walk through that wall and straight into our front yard and not around the block or anything. So that's what's underway. Um, everybody's been asking me, and yes, I'm saving the bricks. Because about 20 million people have asked me that question. So, anyway, we have a wonderful panel tonight. We've been really looking forward to this. And of course, Cyan Crump, Executive Director of Historic Richmond, is going to moderate for us. So, I'll turn this right over to her and we'll get started. Thank you so much, Penny. Can everybody hear me? Is the microphone working great? And is the PowerPoint? There yet. Well, I'll just start talking, and hopefully some pretty images will start coming up. And we're so grateful to the branch for hosting this wonderful lecture. Um, this is a beautiful historic space, and we're so happy to be here. Um, so, when I was a brand new lawyer back in the early 1990s, I spent a day, a whole day, writing a letter to a bank regulator. It was very lawyerly with lots of defined terms and therefores and wherefores. I gave the draft to the senior lawyer and he spent five minutes marking it up. That two-page letter was reduced to one page of chatty vernacular. He said, one of the most important lessons a lawyer must learn is how to turn craft into art. I am reminded of that lesson today as I see Virginia Union University working to turn craft into art with their industrial hall project. This is a story that we are all truly honored and excited to share with you. My predecessors at Historic Richmond geared into action five years ago to support those in the Virginia Union family and in the Richmond community who wanted to save industrial hall. We have an impressive panel of experts to speak to you here tonight about the industrial hall and Virginia Union. Dr. Raymond Pierre Hilton, immediately to my right, was born in Welch, West Virginia, and therefore shares the same hometown as Steve Harvey. And his, father was an, his father was an American GI who took part in the Normandy Beach landings, and his mother was a veteran of the French Resistance. He earned his bachelor's degree at Virginia Commonwealth University in history, political science, and his master's and doctorate in history at University College Dublin, Ireland. He first taught at Virginia Union University in 1988 as an adjunct instructor and became a full-time faculty member in 1991. He has served as department chair and dean and holds the rank of full professor. He is the author of a number of works, including The World's History, Document Sets, Number 2, Ireland's Huguenots and Their Refuge, and Unlikely Haven, and Virginia Union University, and the Virginia Union University website history. Dr. Hilton will provide some background on the history of Virginia Union University, its historic campus, and the Industrial Hall in particular. Emily Hogan, um, is an associate at the architectural firm BCWH and is a licensed architect who specializes in the design of learning environments. Some of her recent projects include the Bridgewater College Library renovation and expansion, the new lower school of St. Michael's Episcopal School, which is currently under construction, and the very impressive Livingdale Library. Uh, she was recognized by the Richmond AIA last year with the Richard L. Ford Award, which is the chapter's highest honor for young architects. Educated at University of North Carolina at Greensboro and Columbia University, Emily has since practiced in Washington, D.C., Oregon, and now Richmond. If Emily looks familiar to you, it may be because you saw her win a car on the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Charles Piper at the, at the far end is a principal with BCWH and leads the firm's practice in higher education planning and design. He has been serving college and university clients in Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic for over 25 years. His, his recent experience includes projects with the University of Richmond, the College of William & Mary, Washington and Lee University, Bucknell University, Morehouse College, Randolph-Macon College, and Virginia Commonwealth University including the recently completed Institute of Contemporary Art. Uh, 
Um, Charles is a graduate of Clemson University and the University of Maryland. His historic building credentials <coughs> include the design and management of the renovations of the Maggie Walker Governor School, studies for the West Hospital for VCU, and VCU's campus heritage planning. Charles I and I want a car. <laughs> <laughs> Charles and Emily will take you inside the industrial hall and share some of the exciting opportunities and challenges of a rehabilitation project of this importance. The fact that we are here tonight speaking with you about industrial hall is a testament to the efforts of those in the Virginia Union family and the community and their love of this building. The rehabilitation of industrial hall was not a foregone conclusion. In fact, after suffering decades of decay, this building was slated for demolition. But many saw Virginia Union's heart and soul in industrial hall. They recognized the importance within the Virginia Union campus, as well as in Richmond's historic built environment. Our thanks go out to the Virginia Union board members, many of whom are here tonight, and to longstanding members of the Virginia Union family, such as Barbara Gray, who spoke up in support of saving this building. Why did so many people care about this building? With its stooped and sagging roof line and its time-darkened granite walls, Barbara Gray saw it as a fitting site to house Virginia Union's <coughs> important collection of Thornton Dial works and other museum assets currently housed in the library. This formidable woman, in her genteel way, has been a force to raise awareness of the benefits of Virginia Union's art collection and help to provide a vision for the building's future. And I can tell you why Historic Richmond cares about it and why we see it as important, not only on the local, but also on a regional and a national scale. Richmond's historic built environment reflects its soul. It's a complex story, no doubt about it, and it reflects the arc of our national history. I like to think that we as a country experienced three revolutions during our first century, and that several of Richmond's historic buildings, including Virginia Union's Industrial Hall, reflect the best ideas and ideals espoused by each of those three revolutions. The first revolution was long on idealism and short on details. This one is easy. We all know Patrick Henry's shell of give me liberty or give me death echoed from the heights of St. John's Church on Richmond's Churchill across the 13 colonies to launch the American Revolution. The second revolution was almost so subtle that many didn't even recognize its revolutionary implications. The Constitutional Convention resolved a loose confederacy of states into a three-branch federal government based on the Virginia Plan, but the Bill of Rights was not insured until the convention in Richmond. The Chaco Bottom Masons Hall played a prominent role in this revolution, but that's the topic for another lecture. Through these revolutions, our founders learned that forming the social compact is a messy process, requiring negotiation and compromise. The constitutional compromise of one of the most fundamental ideals led to the Third Revolution, not until the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution was that final ideal worked out and the blessing of liberty confirmed to all citizens. While the ideal of liberty was embedded in the U.S. Constitution at the end of the Civil War, it would take another 30 years before the Virginia Union campus would successfully take shape, reflecting the generational struggle for black education at the local, regional, and national level. Many of you know that Virginia Union University can trace its birth to the end of the Civil War and to the Lumpkins Devil's Half Acre property. Not until 1896 was land secured and, in, and an ambitious building campaign begun for a true campus. Nine buildings were under construction in 1899. These were buildings of solid Virginia granite. The stonework is of exceptional quality. The architecture is Richardsonian Romanesque, designed by a fashionable architect of national note. The buildings were arranged according to the prevailing architectural and landscape plan for college campuses at the time. Everything about these buildings said, we are strong, we are solid, we are modern, and we will endure for centuries to come. As the foundations of the Virginia Union campus were laid, the ideals of that third revolution were set in stone. 
Truly, this is one of Richmond's most important structures. Completed in 1899, the Industrial Hall was one of those original buildings designed by John H. Coxhead of Buffalo, New York. When built, the Industrial Hall, together with the adjacent barn and power plant, power plant complex, which you see on the left in this photograph, served as a technical resource for, stu for students learning such crafts as iron and metalworking, carpentry, mechanical drawing, and animal husbandry. Over time, the university came to focus exclusively on the academic model of education, and the industrial hall, with its focus on industrial crafts, fell into disuse. VUU today is a premier liberal arts institution of higher education and it has ambitious plans to rehabilitate the industrial hall into a center for arts and creativity. <coughs> With this project, Virginia Union has the opportunity to shape its campus for the future and to be a center of excellence for the development of leaders for tomorrow's world. So, all this talk of ideas and ideals, revolutions and constitutions, industrial education and academic education, all of this is a long way around saying that Virginia Union's Industrial Hall, where industrial education, or craft, once was taught, now will be the center for arts and creativity. That lesson that I found so challenging long ago, Virginia Union has learned it well and is indeed turning craft into art. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to the branch for hosting us. And after, uh, and after the discussion of the panel, we'll have a few minutes for questions. But now, without further delay, I will turn it over to Dr. Hilton to share with you a little bit about the history. Greetings. It was indeed the most ambitious construction project in Richmond of its time. And because in the year 1899, legalized racial discrimination in Virginia was reaching a high water mark, and this was the early portion of the period of history known as the neighbor. More on this later, I'll save it for last. It was undoubtedly the most daring and audacious. The American Baptist Home Mission Society had purchased acres on Lombardi Street in what was then in Michael Campbell and intended to establish a university for African American men, sparing no expense to hire the world famous architect John Hopper Cox, head of Buffalo, to design and build nine structures, mainly out of what was then the finest building materials around. Virginia Granite and Georgia Pine. As the first president of the union, newly born Virginia Union University, the feisty 70 year old Dr. Malcolm McVicker, who's a Scotsman after modern heart, as he adequately explained to some uh, idiotic doubting Thomas who was annoying him, I want walls that will inspire every young man who comes here. On February 11, 1899, the groundbreaking ceremony was held on what would soon become the university campus, proclaiming the merger of two historically black colleges and universities, Virginia Theological Seminary and Wayland College and Seminary, which had been based in Washington, D.C. <coughs> It had taken 34 years to come to this, and the journey had not been easy by a long shot. Wayland College and Seminary was founded in 1865, but of the two, Richmond Theological Seminary, which was originally founded uh, as Richmond Theological School for Freedmen, uh, by the American Baptist Home Mission Society, also in 1865, has a more colorful legacy. <laughs> and an original campus, like no other anywhere, I challenge anybody to find a more unusual, more ironic, a crazier campus, slave jail. 
I mean, I know, uh, I know Spelman boasts of uh, being found in the stable, but I don't think they can top this. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> talk about God working in mysterious ways. Well, anyway. Uh, the difficulties involved in finding campus space and facilities for the new school and what was a still burned out and embittered Richmond led to the appointment of a septuagenarian veteran abolitionist missionary educator named Dr. Nathaniel Culver. He was the go-to person to salvage what was becoming a desperate situation. There was even talk of relocating the school to Norfolk, Atlanta, or White Sulphur Springs. It would not have been awful. <laughs> but Dr. Culver ran into stone walls. He was abused as a northern Yankee abolitionist and a lot of other bad names, and was close to despair when, while walking along Broad Street one sweltering day in July of 1867, he chanced upon a group of worshipers outside the First African Baptist Church, which at that time was located on Broad and College Street, and he unburdened himself to them. One lady in the group, who was described as a large, fair-faced woman, identified herself as Mary Lumpkin, a former slave who had been freed by and married to the notorious slave dealer, Robert Lumpkin. Robert Lumpkin had owned and operated a half-acre complex in Chapel Bottom, that contained the slave jail, tavern, hotel, residence, and auction house. And because of all the torture and suffering that took place there, it was widely feared and despised as the devil's half acre. In one of history's more bizarre twists, Mrs. Lockton, now widowed and owner of the property, rented the complex to Dr. Culver for what was then a very reasonable rate of $1,000 per year. It is asserted that there were still metal bars on the windows and that the two instructors used former whipping posts for selectors. Three years later, the American Baptist Home Mission Society used a $10,000 grant from the Freedmen's Bureau to purchase the United States Hotel on 19th and Main Street and move out of Lumpkins, which undoubtedly to the relief of some of the students who must have had unpleasant members of the place. Uh, there the school, which would be renamed Richmond Theological Seminary in 1886, would remain until the 1899 merger. Coxhead and the Vickers plans resulted in the construction of nine edifices which were later dubbed the Nine Noble Buildings. They included Pickford Hall, which was the main classroom building, Coburn Hall, the chapel and the library, Kingsley Hall, the dormitory, Martin E. Gray Hall, the, uh, the cafeteria, Baptist Memorial Hall, which was the dean's residence, Porter Cottage, which was the president's residence, Industrial Hall, the power plant, and the bank, barn, sorry. Of these, the last three, Industrial Hall, the Power Plant, and the Bank, are the unsung and little-known structures. The Industrial Hall contained two stories of an attic. The ground floor contained an iron metal fabrication shop, a blacksmith forge, and a molding room. On the second floor, a carpenter shop was set up with workbenches, two complete set of carpenter's tools and turning legs, and there was a small room set aside to provide instruction and mechanical drawing. The attic was designed to store both working material and finished work produced by individual students who were assigned into class groups to number no more than 24. An elevator was installed to transport students and instruction instructors from one floor to the next. The powerhouse was located next to the industrial building. The main structure was also made from granite, but a large octagonal smokestack, which stands to this day, was the most conspicuous feature. There was an artisanal well nearby, 
which was some 200 feet in depth and served for the university water supply. Virginia Union was also to be sufficient as regards power. The power plant, to be maintained mostly by students, was to provide steam, heat, and electric lighting for all the buildings and to power the machines for the industrial plant. The barn adjoined the power and industrial houses and at a short distance and contained a tool room, a carriage room, a stall which could house up to four horses, stanchions for up to eight cows, and a henry and piggery. The hope was expressed that the university could be self-sufficient, not only in generation of its own power and water supply, but in the production of milk and eggs, and maybe, maybe occasionally some ham and drumsticks. But anyway, <laughs> the barn afforded students with the opportunity for an early version of work study through feeding, taking care of the animals, cleaning the stalls, milking the cows, and collecting the eggs. Uh, Industrial Hall was in the main, originally founded by the Black Baptist congregations, who had raised $8,000, a huge sum in those days, for its construction in 1899. However, it was not yet operational because an additional $3,000 had to be raised for the machines and other industrial equipment. And the congregations had only been able to muster $700 as the year 1900 came to a close. However, and coinc not coincidentally, I'm sure, uh, and not as fit that Dr. McVicker would lead his readers and listeners to believe, he received a visit from the famous business tycoon, Henry Kirk Porter who lived from 1840 to 1921. At least Mr. Porter was famous at the turn of the 20th century, though he's not well known now. Henry K. Porter was born in Concord, New Hampshire, was a Civil War Union Army veteran and a founder of the YMCA, who served as president of the Pittsburgh YMCA from 1868 to 1887. In 1866, he founded a locomobile manufacturing company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which became known as H.K. Porter Company Incorporated. The company is set to produce more industrial locomotives than any other firm in the United States. The company still exists in Pittsburgh and is mainly engaged in the manufacture of industrial tools like cutters, and hydraulic hoses and power packs. But look them up on the net, they're still advertising their tools. Uh, Henry Kirk Porter served on a few board of trustees from 1899 to 1908, during which time he served the term from 1903 to 1905 as a Republican in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 31st Congressional District of Pennsylvania. Porter at first donated literally the Porter Cottage, the aforementioned President's House. The Porter Cottage was demolished in 1865 to make way for the present Ellison Hall, and that's a decision I don't understand at all. The original slab dedicated to dedicating the building to Porter's parents exists to this day in Ellison Hall on campus. Uh, the upshot of the conversation was that Mr. Porter agreed to advance the remaining $2,300 and Industrial Hall was finally operational. We have one very poetic description of the hall's functioning at an open house held at the university in May of 1902. Quote, the voices of, of visitors mingled with the hum of machinery standing by the benches where the students were making different articles to show the work of the machinery. Ever and anon, the ring of steel told us that horseshoes were being made. Every visitor left this department astonished and surprised, unquote. <laughs> Other descriptions Manny mentioned a 20 horsepower gasoline engine and that the students could become proficient in carpentry repairs, furniture repairs, masonry, hole and furniture painting, plastering, and whitewash. Everyone's familiar also 
with the difference in opinion between the two great leadership figures in the African American community in the early 1900s. Of course, I'm talking about Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Washington is the advocate for a more technical, industrial orientation to education, and Du Bois espousing a more academically emphasized program. There's more to it than that, but for our purposes, we'll stick to that. Uh, the end result was that the university opted to turn in a more Du Boisian academic direction. To an extent, I think this was probably a predisposed tendency, since both Wayland and Richmond Theological Seminary, there the strongest emphasis had always been on training for the ministry. Technical class, while still being required of some students, were deemed to be only helpers in educating the whole student and not ends in itself. To quote the university catalog, the course in manual training is not intended to cover the entire work in a regularly organized trade school. Such manual training is given as will be useful to the student in his chosen life's work. Uh, we seem to try to have a little both ways for a while. But the General Education Board deemed Virginia Union to be insufficiently committed to industrial rural training, and it received very little from that philanthropic organization. To explain, the General Education Board had been established by John D. Rockefeller Sr. of Standard Oil and Frederick T. Gray Gates to award grants to HBCUs, uh, but were generally uh, to, we were generally too academically organized to please Mr. Rockefeller, who preferred the Washington model. On one occasion, we made a concession to require manual training courses for what we call the academy, which was our high school division at the time. Nonetheless, the first two presidential administrations of Dr. McVicker from 1899 to 1904 and Dr. George Rice Covey from 1904 to 1918 took uh, stuck doggedly to the original idea and it prevailed into the early years of the university's third administration under President William John Clark. Clark, whose tenure of office lasted 22 years and thus was the, the longest for a president of Virginia Union University, proved to be an agent of change. Under his aegis, the requirement for technical instruction was dropped in 1926. The academy itself was terminated in 1930, and in 1934, the industrial hall is not mentioned again in the catalog. After 1941, the barn disappears from uh, mention, and may well have been demolished soon after. The power plant is like is likewise dismissed by silence at that time, though not demolished. At some point in time, the industrial hall was boarded up and laid derelict for years. The decline of the forgotten three buildings, as I call them, may well have coincided with the opening of the previously all male VU campus to co-education, uh, which put such financial pressure on Hartshorn Memorial College that it merged into Virginia Union in 1932. President Clark then moved to more definitively down the path of academic education, a, a trend he had already furthered by initiating a law school and a school of education. And this would be continued by his successor, Dr. John Malthus Ellison, one of whose uh, most singular contribution out of many was the establishment of the Graduate School of Theology. Oh, the Nader. I have not heard that term before. Okay. The Nader, that was a term coined by the renowned historian Dr. Rayford Logan to designate the late 19th and early 20th century as being the time when race relations were at an all-time low and when racism in the United States was more rampant than at any other period after the Civil War. Uh, such a time when there were more lynchings, more race riots by whites on black, 
more discriminatory legislation than at any other time, it took a lot of courage to establish Virginia Union and keep it going at that time. Oh, well, Dr. Logan, by the way, was the chair of history department at Virginia Union University from 1925 to 1930. You know I end with history. Thank you very much. Um, but also 